He was a musical uh, director for Nancy Wilson and uh, orchestra leader, and uh, I got played some gigs at the Blue Room and came through town. Of course, you know, we know uh, Mike from the Headhunters, every Hancock's Headhunters, and uh, but they have a lot more history than that. So you know, if you just kind of give, you know, I'm the old guy, but these are the young people here, so I guess they <laughs> they need a little background. Blue Room. I played the Blue Room here when I was nine. Wow. Nine. I did as a as a as a. So only Buddy Rich did stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I did. I played it again later with Tony Meta, but I played it when I was nine as a guest soloist with the Jim with the who's that guy that had big bag John Jimmy Dean. Jimmy. Yeah, like a. And the big and the band was led by a trumpet player from New Orleans named Murphy Campbell. Yeah. Oh yeah, Murphy Campbell. Did yeah. you know him? Oh yeah, sure. I know. Wow. I yeah, I played with him when I have a picture of me. And Dr. John playing with him when I was wow. 11, and he must have been 13. Wow, wow. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. We played bass yeah. then. Yeah, that was an interesting era. I think, you know, a lot of young, young, younger cats don't know about, but uh, a lot of, like, um, sort of nightclub, big entertainment nightclubs. There was one in New Orleans called Blue Room, which was at the Fairmont Hotel. And uh, they would bring in, you know, big name entertainment, you know, and there was, there was an orchestra, a house orchestra, a big band. And uh, you come in, like, like when uh, Nancy Wilson came in, Mike comes in and rehearses the band, brings charts, and we all have to, to you know, learn the show. And then you do the show, what, you know, five nights a week or yeah, something. we did it, I think, uh, yeah, you know, about a two-hour rehearsal to learn the show. And then, right. Yeah, then it's six nights a week for two weeks. Mm -hmm. that, that was a typical Fairmont gig. Right, right, right. And Dick Stabile was the Dick uh, Stabile, right. really good guy. Orchestra. It was a great orchestra, a big fat that trumpet player, man. Oh, yeah. What was that? Uh, what was the name? Well, we're called Yeah, yeah. Well, I would buy the smaller symbol of one eye because I want to be able to change colors. I don't think yeah, I can. Yeah, you want to, you want to, you have a. Yeah. If you got, you I'd like a 17. Well, that's fine. Yeah. But yeah, that was, all the musicians, I mean, there was a lot of gigs, man. There were a lot of cats that came in and out of the band. And even, even during the two weeks when the first time it was. Uh, Steve and he had sent in Emily Rimlar to sub and, right. and you know people didn't care as long as they covered it right. whoever showed up. Yeah, you know. I think a lot of that too had a lot to do with just the fact that if you had if you had towns that had strong unions, New Orleans has never been a strong union town like the Musicians Union, but when you had a big hotel with a, with a, a giant room for entertainment. Yeah. The union required that they hire so many musicians. Yeah, and that's that allowed them to yeah. hire a big man. Wow, you know? I remember all that. Yeah, you're right. God, I haven't heard that that mentality. That yeah, that right, was. Right. What it was well, it was a good. Yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm not a union guy. It's no, no, no. Great, but I mean, but it's like it, it had a good benefit to, to that. I mean, you know, it, it put a lot of musicians yeah. to work. In that. Yeah, no, I did a lot of those gigs too out in California, the Circle right. Store. So I, what I meant was, I just haven't heard. It's like that was an interesting period, though. Right. Because it put a lot of guys to work. You had to read good. Right. And interpret, not just read the notes. Well, there's no play MIDI. The band. Oh, no MIDI. MIDI. You know, I did a lot of <laughs> bizarre shows, like some really great ones, Gladys Knight, The Pimps, Jimmy Durante. Oh, Jimmy. oh yeah, it was a yeah, wide yeah. range of love. Yeah, I still understand. Bob Hope, yeah. Nat Cole. Yeah. No, but there was, you know, it's now when you're out playing, like we have this Thank new you. album. Yeah, no Mike and I have a band called Clark Expedition. We actually just decided that we've both been leaders individually for years and years. And so let's team up and put a band together. It's basically just the two of us, and then we just hire whoever we want, you know. <laughs> Play with a lot of different. Play with Christian McBride or James Keenan. or we play with Jeff Berlin. Or, you know, all different bass players. We use different horn players. So it's a lot of times just trio. But and we can come to a town and we'll play maybe sometime with Singleton. You know, James Singleton. Whatever. Who did we play with the last time? I'm sorry. Who was the other bass player we played with here last time? Um, you would know Barry. No, no, no. no, no. I mean, when we played at uh, Snug. Uh, uh, Roland oh, Garrett. Uh, Roland Garrett. Singleton. Singleton? No, it was another cat from Noka, the guy that... Oh, no, you know who it was? was oh, uh, Chris Severn. Chris, yeah. Chris, Chris yeah. Yeah, so we played, you know, but I mean, that it's in a way, it's like a a functional way to survive, because if you tra travel around with a band now, it's really hard. Like, we're yeah. going to do a tour. We are going to do it... I mean, it's rare to even get to go on tour, so next week we're going to do a week in the Midwest, six, six gigs and seven nights, and we'll drive with Jeff Berlin. <laughs> That'll be fun. Yeah, that's actually fun to get out. You know, you know the thing is, is like all, all, I think is like when I'm all, when I do uh, clinics, I'm instead of talking about how fast I like uh, 
a great drumming technique as much as anybody and the slick and the newest beats and all that. But what I always try to talk about, what makes me, uh, my phone ring, and I'm able to make a living like since I've been, I got out, of, I went on the road out of high school with Vince Guaraldi and I'm still going. And I think it's because I put, I listened to what the older cats had to say and uh, I put a lot of time into learning the language of a lot of different <coughs> eras, you know, like 50s, 60s and all the way to whatever we're doing now. And I would really study, made a, I just made it, it was something I was attracted to so I made a study out of that. So that way I, could, I don't have to have a favorite group of people to play with. I can accommodate all those different uh, <coughs> understandings and it feels good to me to do it. It's a creative thing for me. Uh, and big band, all of the, all the colors that one needs. Of course, I can only speak from back here from the drums, but um, I think it's a language that we speak. So if you go to another country, and and if I went to wherever you're from or, or your parents are from, okay, uh, and well, if I if I went to another country and tried to speak the language and I didn't know the vocabulary, I I couldn't. I have to point to order food or a beer or whatever, you know. So, uh, jazz music, funk, R&B, I think the language is uh, so that we can communicate with each other. So you can play, like Michael says, with new cats every night. It's not that hard to do. It's a challenge because, but it's not that hard to do. As long as they speak the language. Yeah. I mean, there's some people that are stuck in certain eras and are, I mean, the, the sort of paradigm for me was, well, I was the last pianist with Cannonball Adderley, and in that band, it was in 75, we play out, we play, I play roads and lots of effects and stuff. We play Scrapple from the Apple. You know, it wasn't about just one type of thing, but it was the, the feeling underneath it was always coming from the blues and kind of a soulful feeling. So to me, uh, rather than just sticking with one style, what I like to do is just have a certain feeling underneath the music. And I think that that's why Mike and I were able to look up, because no matter what we do, we always try to put something in it. And truthfully, I teach at the New School in New York, and I teach the R&B Review Ensemble, you know, and, and there's some people in there, you know, it's all students your age, and some of them are coming from, you know, I have some guys, like I have a guy who's the keyboard player with Ludacris, I have Right now, Prince's musical director is getting her degree there, you know, so I have these people that are just unbelievable at the R&B. And then I have some regular, you know, jazz white guys from Connecticut, you know, but they want to do it, they're into it. But it's, so we're kind of melding it in to try to make sure that the feeling is always happening. And, you know, these other cats that are playing with Ludacris, he's trying to learn all the intellectual shit, so he's practicing his, you know, scales and, and trying to figure out the harmony. So it's a nice mix, but ultimately, you want everybody to have the same language so that it can be free. I mean, our whole thing is that when we play, you know, we have a structure, but we really, we don't stick to the structure, you know? I mean, that's the fun of it, to me, break it up. I like to get lost, sometimes we get lost, that's what I decide. So, you know, it takes a lot of years and confidence. I mean, Steve, we play together, it's the same thing. It's like, wherever it goes, it goes, you know? But what we have that saves us is having an understanding, and I think, I was never a guy that wrote out, I never wrote out a solo or anything. I mean, I tried to write out McCoy Tyner's Passion Dance solo. I got about 16 bars and I went, I'm just gonna figure out what this dude was thinking about what he was feeling. So when I listen to Chick Corea coming up, you know, I don't have the greatest ear. I mean, I can figure the stuff out, but recently I was writing out this Ornette thing. I went, God damn, you know, it's, it's worth it to do it. But I'd rather fear, fear, figure out what the dude's feeling, you know, and what's he trying to say, what's the, and, and then do it my way. That's the way I approach it. So it's different than really the way jazz education is often when I meet people. It's, and not a, you know, and a lot of real famous jazz musicians did it this way, where you imitate somebody and you kind of build your own style. But for me, the approach was more trying to get underneath it and then see what happens. You know? But when I came to New Orleans, I would hear all these cats, and you know, I really got you know, James Borker. Assimilator to me, all these different styles, and then I just want to kind of to come out the way I want to do it. That's what I encourage students to do, and I think it's not maybe I don't know how much to talk about is to try to have your own thing, your own style, and I think it's really hard to do. And so, you know, we just kind of think maybe, and maybe there are certain people that just do it, they just have their own thing. I don't know, but it seems like to me, if you people spend a lot of time listening to people other famous people, but you could spend a lot of time listening to yourself. So 
So I think one thing I encourage you to do is play, record yourself. If you find a measure of music that you think is great and it's you, then I would work on that. But that and all the keys, you know, whatever. We need to get that out. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, yeah, we, we used, would you say that bebop is maybe like one of the common denominators of, you know, like we, you know, because I know you're kind of, that's, that's one of the things, I remember the last time you did a clinic here, that was one of the things that, I guess it was one of your pet peeves, is everybody thinks that he was like this incredible funk player, but you, you're really heavily based in bebop and, and well, jazz, was, and, and then you kind of get annoyed sometimes when people just want to hear the funk stuff or whatever. Yeah, know? that was my whole thing, was I never considered myself a funk, I wasn't even thinking about that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when I got to gig with Herbie Hancock, I wasn't going to tell him no, just because he wanted to play, <laughs> you know, this. Of this. You know, I mean, but but the majority of uh, I came from uh, the old school, the actual bebop Max Roach type drumming. Although I play a different style. Now Herbie, uh, one of the things about the language thing once again is is I got this from Hancock. If you know enough vocabulary, then you can really create your own style. You can put your, I mean, we're all different people, so we're gonna have our own style anyway, but you can put your spin on things. So I came from this style of drumming. I'll just make this quick and brief, but you know, they're very old school. ideas like I could go on, but I ended up on a much more modern place, which I'll demonstrate uh, when we play. But that's the root of my thing, that and the blues. I played a lot of blues with when I was a kid. I played with Albert King and Albert Collins and Jimmy Reed, and I don't even know if you know these guys, but da da da. But I played a million blues gigs as a kid, both acoustic jazz type blues and um, you know electric guitar style. But um, I'll just make this quick for the drummers. Uh, one thing I notice, uh, swing music, swing is a rhythm, so it's not mental, it's a beat. So the same as we can, th this type of drumming here, this type of groove, not drumming. Swing is also solid, it's a beat. Put it here. So it's, it's not uh, a mental. You can play it more relaxed, but it's still. I mean, there's, you can really loosen that up and do a lot of things with it. But I just want you to know the drummers, and you already know this, I'm sure, but just in case, uh, if you're going to play jazz music, you have to be able to play a good, strong beat. That's what the, the band is going to depend on, is, you know? So I know a lot of guys, if, if they're thinking the groove, I see a lot of guys playing <coughs> exactly. uh, You're not going to, uh, you know, people like me will steal your gig. You know what I mean? Like, guaranteed. You know, so, so no matter how out you go or how much uh, uh, facility you have or even how much language you have, it's always uh, keep in touch with the rhythm of, of swing. Um, funk is the same thing, of course, but it's so blatant that I choose to talk about this because, you know, the symbol is uh, a, 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 it's legato, it's long, it's, you know, the note doesn't die right away. So. You don't want to get lost inside that sound trying to figure out where the bass player is and where you are and where the band is. You have to lay it down and still negotiate being a good human and sharing it with others. But if the, if the clutch is going to slip, then you have to take care of it. That's your job from this perspective. You know, even as out as Mike and I go, if I feel the time slipping, then I, take, then I hold it for it. I, get, I, I, I have an instinct that gets me back to it. You know, so that's really important. You know, that uh, is understanding your role as a drummer. I like, to, I like to play a lot of ideas, but I also like to just, I can play with bass and just play with one hand and I would love it. You know, the same as I'm not married to one time period, I gravitate towards one time period, but I have as much fun playing uh, th this style. <laughs> with 
or I did or whatever. So um, the whole thing for me is a creative uh, experience, no matter if I'm playing straight and simple or if I'm trying to ex expand on it, make the music more expansive and take it somewhere. You feel me on this? Did I make sense to you? Or yeah. Yeah. Was I? I had coffee and I maybe in my <laughs> mind. <laughs> Talk about you know you you because this is an issue I'm sure with all nine drummers and I'm sure it's an issue with drummers too. But before when you were talking about the drum competition, that they gave it to the guy with the best feel, mm -hmm. not necessarily the guy with the most chops. Right. And you know we've all experienced the situations where we have drummers that just play the drums and they don't play the music. Right. How do you how do you address that to when you recognize that in a drum student? That, you know, somebody is just into playing the drums and it's not really aware of like being supportive. Yeah, you because know, the drums are like you, you know you're the orchestrator of the band. You know, right. and you can make powerful things players. happen or not or die depending on how you interact with the other musicians and stuff like that. So what, yeah, what, what I, advice I think, do you give the drummers or you know? I, I I did a clinic. Well, that's a great question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I did. Really, I mean, you know, it's no it is. It's an important. I did a drum show in Chicago recently. You remember that drummer, Ed Shaughnessy from The Tonight Show? You guys know this guy? He's a great drummer. Well, anyway, he's a tremendous player. You know? I know him. And, I'm not old. Yeah, yeah. So am I. And he's older than we are. Uh, I, and he said this. All these guys got up there and played their stuff. And there was many great, great drummers there. And Ed got up and he said, I never, and this is a guy who's had a huge career, like very successful. He was on TV, Tonight Show band, and he also you know, for 30 years or whatever, you know, so you know he made some serious bank. And uh, and then he also uh, played drums on a great, uh, Jimmy Smith, one of his breakthrough records, Walk on the Wild Side. And this guy can really swing and he can play anything. He's great and he can sight read anything. And he's a hell of a drummer. Um, he said his opening salvo to, the, to a, a, a huge audience was, no band leader and sooner, no band leader has ever called me and said, get me a sub that can solo fantastic and can't play good time. You know what I mean? Like, so that's the thing. The joy eventually, if you're not there already, and if you're not, you will be, and many of you may already be there. I know there's a different level of students nowadays that seem to really be, I think it's because of these schools that you're lucky. I didn't get to go to a school like this, so I think you guys are very fortunate. I'm serious. You learn big band, you learn so, so being around all of these creative people and, and, and a great staff of teachers, you're able to deal with the music. Um, more than, if I didn't play this, I'd play bass, yeah. I'd play trumpet, I'd play, it didn't have to be the drums. But I'm, in other words, I'm into the music. I like the, uh, of what's going on in the music. I like the conversation of, of, I find that the most interesting, not how fast or how loud a guy can play. But I, uh, for people who are, uh, play drums like that, I'd just rather listen to them without a band. I'd pay them to just to sit next to them and steal all of their licks. I really would. I, mean, <laughs> I love that kind of drumming. But I don't know whether I like the music that goes with it, you know. Um, if a guy uses it musically, then it's really then that's the man that wins the prize, <laughs> you know. I would say. Anyway, that's my take on that. <clears throat> that's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. No, I think it's, just, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, it's it is that you want to. I think what you're saying is also if you want to. Well, the way I think, if you want to be able to go away from the, the harmony or really go out, it's, and if you're playing on something that has a structure, mm -hmm. it's good to know the structure so that you can go away from it, you know, but have it underneath. You, know, you don't even have to hear the structure, but it's good to have it underneath. You know. But you've probably been in situations like that, too, where, where you feel like, man, this drummer's just like not in tune with what I'm doing at all. And, and uh, I'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm talking, you know it's like it, well any it's not just drummers it's any instrument I mean to me you know I I, did, I made two albums with Christian McBride and Tony Williams and uh, mm -hmm. in the early 90s and I was really nervous and uh, I had this piano guy I was the piano teacher and he said to me you don't have to be nervous let them play you man you don't have to do anything so well, I feel like you want to be in a situation where everybody's playing everybody else. In other words, that, that you're not forcing anything to happen. It's like sports, you know. You, you, sports, you got to be in the zone, and you got to be so it's just happening. And you can't think, you know. If somebody hits a line drive, you don't have time to think about it. You just have to catch it, you know. And I think music is the same way. If I'm playing, 
you know, I'm, if I'm doing a standard, I can play a standard, but I wanted what I'm playing to be coming out of what they're doing, and I want what they're doing to come out of what I'm, I'm doing. You know, really is a nice conversation. It's not a lecture like this, it's a conversation. You know? And there'll be times when I get everybody to stop, I got it, you know, then I'll do my thing, or I'll do a down solo. But if I'm playing, to me, I think, and I think it is a little, it's just philosophical. I love the interaction, you know. Maybe Oscar Peterson trio, maybe he's just burning and they play with him. I don't, you know, I don't know what they were thinking about. But I love the interaction. I mean, to me, I think my favorite pianist was always Herbie Hancock. And Herbie Hancock's an amazing, you know, he's not an amazing uh, trio pianist. He doesn't have a left hand. He, he you know, don't say to me, oh, I got a left hand. You know, he's not that kind of musician. He's like some kind of big picture musician. And he's an amazing accompanist, you know, when he's playing with him. That's why he worked. He didn't work because he was the greatest. There's a million guys, you know, who could play more shit than him in, in terms of really piano and jazz piano style, you know. He, he's a great, great player. Yeah, what makes a really great accompanist? That's a, that's I, think, I think it's really interesting. Well, you know, the word is comp. So comp is to compliment or accompany. I love that it has two meanings. So in other words, if I'm, I already took a lot, I always have taken a lot of pride, and I learned this on the job training of being able to accompany. And what's particularly hard for, our, for our choral instruments to accompany a singer, because you know how singers are, right? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I mean, singers are just, you know, I love the jokes, right? <laughs> <laughs> the singer comes to the gig and say, hey, I got an idea, why don't you play the first eight of Stella by Starlight B flat? Then go to the bridge of my funny Valentine and see, and then come back to Stella a half step below that. She goes, How could I do that? She says, You did it last night. <laughs> so, you know. That was so, a joke. <laughs> unfortunately, it's kind of true. But I mean, as an accompanist on the piano, I mean, what, whether it's a great, you know, I play with Cannon or Sonny Rollins or whoever I play with. I remember when I joined Cannonball's band, and the two trumpet, the two horn players were Nat Adderley, his brother, played cornet, and Cannon, and uh, Roy McCurdy was the drummer, and Walter Brooker the bass. But those guys were like churning it up, you know. So it was up to the, I feel the piano players in between, like the rhythm section, like that, and then the horns, you know. I'm, I'm creating colors, and uh, I remember calling Zawinul because Nat Adderley, I really just instinctually knew what to do with Cannon. Was playing so much shit, you know. He'd be playing in C, and he'd be in F sharp, and I was trying, you know, couldn't quite hear what he was doing. It, but he played so soulful and bluesy. It sounded all inside, but it was so out. And I called Zavano, who played with the band for ten years. I go, Joe, man, I, I need a little help, man. And he had been really friendly to me when I got the gig. You know, yeah, he called me. I go, you know, Nat, I figured it out, but with Cannon, man, I just don't know what to do. He's playing all the different pieces. He goes, if you figure it out, call me back. Because you wanna, I mean, it's like you wanna, you wanna lay it down, and you can't, you know, as a piano, you can just lay it down, like, you know, like Red Garland or something. You know, it's just kind of like being part of the rhythm section, but. I also like to interact, so if a guy plays some stuff, I want to like push him. So, you know, you have, to, it's also just personal, you know how people are, some people don't like to be touched, some people like to be hugged, you know? So if I'm playing with somebody, I gotta figure out, and it's not usually by conversation. It can be, I mean, a guy can say, you know, I, I like actually, we were playing with Jeff Berlin, this bass player, he goes, I love it. I said, in your solos, do you want me to come? He goes, please come, please. Yeah, well, some bass players don't want you to play, and then, so. But like I love it when the, the guy's playing and then he plays something and I can interact and it doesn't mean I'm going to imitate him. I don't usually like that, you know, people cop it. This, sometimes it's cool, but, or I don't like quotes really, those kind of things. But I like to be able to push the person or, oh, you gave me that idea, like, here's this harmony, here's this, and they go, you know. To me, that's the fun of it. So, if, and, and again, if the, if the rhythm section's not there, you, you just can't fight it. I can't fight a drummer. You know, I'm a piano player, and it's a percussion instrument, but I cannot fight uh, a loud drum, or, you know, a saxophone. I just can't fight it. We all, you have to, have to give it up to me, or I'm just like, you know, fuck it. You know? Come back when you're ready to play with me, because I can't bang it out of them. You know, I, it's just the instrument. Now, when I have my Rhodes and my synthesizer, turn it up to 10, I play with Jean-Luc Ponty, and that guy was sort of an asshole, I thought. <laughs> so I just turn the shit up, or really? 
<laughs> it's going to be the end of this gig, and it was, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was a lovely concert in Europe, the last concert, man. I just turned all my shit up to 10, man. I had a B3 in a row. It was our Odyssey. And <laughs> <laughs> don't take your scale, man. But, you know, that's not you. That's not you. That's not you. That's not you. That's I was too young to know what it was about, you know. So maybe we should play a little bit. Yeah. Who, who, who's the bass player? Uh, Noah. Hey, no. Why don't you want to play with yeah, you? Saxo. Cool. You know, yeah. Anybody want to play too? You know, Mark Stream. Yeah, saxophone is a great saxophone player. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, get this play a little or something. Yeah, we got. Oh yeah, you want to do that funk stream? See, Mike, here's the interesting thing, you know, Mike and I both, I got known from playing with Ken and we don't understand how long, kind of like a more commercial thing. I think we're both, that's not where we're at, but that's sort of how it got known. So we make we make this album, I go, Mike, they put some of that funk stuff in it, you know, it's going to work for us, and then stretch it out. So what we've tried to do is take that background stuff and blend it in with being covered. You know, it's a good job. Uh -huh. You know, actually, I want to tell you this. Um, or all the answers to this, to these problems. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it is number yeah, ten. Yeah. It's number ten on the charts. It's only been out ten days. I know you guys are students. It's going to be a struggle for you to pay for this. We're going to even charge you extra. So <laughs> you really appreciate. Just kidding. No, one thing we have we, we have found out doing clinics that if you're like a B sure. student, you, you buy a CD. Yeah, you you will become an A student. Uh, <laughs> 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 Let's try a little straight for a little kind of right. play a little funky thing and yeah. um, maybe go into swing, whatever. We'll see what happens when we get there. Are you going to go to an
that one on your CD? Huh? Did y'all record yeah. that one? We recorded, uh, we didn't, oh, you know what we call them. We, no, we didn't, but we came up with this. I've been working on these cross rhythms, these fives and sevens, so, you know, if we're like one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So Mike was over at my house, he goes, hey man, let's do a monk tune in seven and then do the bridge in five. <laughs> so we did that with in walk bud. So you want to try it with us? I'm going to try it now. So here's what we're going to do. Check this out. Uh, it's, you know, do you know the tune in walk bud? It's this F minor. It's a bit, look, you don't even know the tune because we don't play the tune. So here's what we're going to do. Just in seven, like... two minutes at my house and so we don't have anything right now and then the next night we played it in jazz at Lincoln Center and we had this big concert <laughs> kill you know but so Mike you started out you know he's going to mess up it's great it's fun to mess up if you get yeah. through this if you can make it through this and not get an mess a. it up you, your CD is only going to cost 17 bucks <laughs> 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 